All right, greetings, people. It's me and Kurt. I want to hit you with the spiel, then we'll get started. Today's episode is an episode about Nandrolone. <laughs> You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. Warning! This is for entertainment purposes only. Do not take this seriously. This is not medical advice. Although I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor yet. If you want me to be your doctor, clip the link in the description box. But otherwise, this is just for fun, kids. Don't do this at home. So mm -hmm. I've been neglecting to, yeah, close the door because there's the games are afoot. So I have been neglecting to tell our audience that Kurt, on top of having the best book on uh, growth <laughs> hormone in the world, is also a coach. So both of us do coaching, um, and our links are in the description box. So if you like one or both of us or either of us, feel free to give us a holler. I have a link tree, and in that link tree, there's a bunch of links. You can pick the link that's for you. If you don't want to read, you just want to fire and forget, then the top link is the consult link. And I will triage you to the care that you need. Also, under Kurt's description, there'll be the Atomic Life Coaching.com. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. It's a, there'll be the general link, and then there'll be the link just for the ebook that's already in the cart, ready for you to go, so that you have like a, a close to a one buy button that Amazon provides yeah. for your growth hormones, <laughs> growth hormone education. So I guess before we get started on the Nandrolone thing, I just had an interesting case study. I'm not going to name the patient's name because it kind of caught me off guard and I'm not an expert on sweating. Are you an expert on sweating? No, no, I, I would say no. Okay. Well, then I will. All right. So I may not have all the details memorized. This is a very smart man who is very good historian and knows his medical pharmacology and all that stuff is very very educated man and um he had competed in a show came off of everything went on hrt and then started having symptoms of extreme sweating some anxiety and some low sex drive and of course his mr magoo fuck hard doctors did not ever test his thyroid so that's the first place I want to look was I figured that because he's not, he doesn't have dry skin and hot skin without sweating. It's not muscarinic antagonism and he doesn't have hyper sweating and drowsiness per se. So it's not muscarinic overload. He's got apathy. He's got low sex drive. He's got super hot skin and poor temperature control that results in sweating as soon as he starts training and he has anxiety i think that it's thyroid yeah. what do you think Kurt? Maybe it could be estrogen too what? his estrogen was crashed he's slowly yeah. trying to bring that up and it's been getting better that would be the first place i would look but you thyroid could definitely be okay, okay. So, so my goal with yeah. this person is just to stabilize his hormones and make sure we do cognitive behavioral therapy for his anxiety. And hopefully, by, we've got three inputs going into this sweating, which is anxiety, hyperthyroidism, and then low estrogen. So by estrogen. bringing the estrogen up, we'll pull away from the input there. By normalizing his thyroid, I should pull away from the input there. And hopefully, because his thyroid elevation goes down and as estrogen comes up his anxiety will go away organically rather than yep. needing therapy but a lot of you like that plan sounds good to me what so right, he cool. just came out of a show nope it was just a consult no no i know what was his what was the previous part he was a bodybuilder yeah okay and he finished the show do you know anything about what he was using during that program? No, not really. I didn't get that much details on it. Yeah, and I know people are like, that's so slipshod. And it's like, yep. The thing is... It doesn't really matter. It just it, it, To me, what matters more is getting modern blood work done yeah, and then no, being able to review the blood work because I need to know what's going on right now. Now, not previously. 
uh, it's helpful. Yeah, but, I just like to know as much as I can about a situation before making the guess. Right, and yeah, and that's one of those things where because that's technically an illegal subject, people don't fill out their intake forms with extreme detail because it's incriminating themselves legally. So I think that if I couldn't solve the problem with my normal methods, then I could go and do a more um, thorough check. Like for instance, the woman that we talked about earlier in the week where I, where there was a DHT supplement being, not DHT, DHEA supplement being used. And I didn't know that she was using a DHEA supplement we went right to a because it wasn't on her intake form. And I, the only thing I could come up with was a tumor and I'd already ordered the CAT scan. And it turned out that, no, when I double checked with her, I'm having the uh, warming up to there's a 50% chance you'll live five years. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm taking this um, DHEA supplement. And I was like, what? Like, oh, yeah, man, yeah. that explains it. Was it. Black yeah, it was from Blackstone Labs. And she didn't know that they were known for lacing their um, their products with steroids. And that that the the one time the urban legend is actually true is Blackstone Labs, and it's yeah, like oh my much. god. Well, and I guess the moral of the story is you probably should let your doctor know everything you're taking before they try to make a diagnosis. You know, I could go back and look at the intake form, and maybe the DHEA was on there, but because mm -hmm. as we discussed, DHEA doesn't really do anything that we know of. I kind of just ignore DHEA yeah. a lot of but, the time. But, but like I explained after that call, like so, women it only turns to testosterone, right? Men it's estrogen. So that explains her crashed estrogen. And... Right. Yeah. So but we didn't know it's that. one That's of the one variable that was missing. Yeah, and and for people watching this, please don't be terrified. I don't discuss your name or identifying characteristics with Kurt or anyone else. But I will ask the person's permission. Like, do I have your permission to consult with people? who are smarter than me or as smart as me about your case if I get stuck. Because usually when it's these situations, somebody's coming to me because they've went to 10 different doctors and no one has an answer. Yeah, and then yeah. somebody recommends me to them and they're like, if anybody knows what this is, it's going to be Todd. And then I look at it and I'm like, um, I've got some ideas, but do I know what's going on? No, I don't know what's going on. Like today, I actually talked to somebody who had been going to get their blood drawn, blood um, phlebotomized. They've been half a liter taken out every couple months for five years and they never told him to hydrate. And so the one time he hydrates, his hemoglobin came back as 46. So for five years, he was getting, he had to go off a gear, quit competing, get his blood drained for five years and he just wasn't hydrated. That was all it was. So it's like, it's scary how bad other doctors are and what's even scary. And people are like, oh, you're so arrogant. You think you're better than other people. It's like, no, the data suggests that. And I'm just analyzing the data. It's yeah, like, and, and I think that people, people watching can understand. So Todd and I talk about a lot of things like this. Again, I never know names of anybody. We don't talk about specifics. But I look at things from a research point of view and topics from a clinical point of view. We always seem to end up at the same place just kind of miraculous right i don't think you and i have ever disagreed it, it would it. it would imply that we would do what we were doing <laughs> it was like, the, the two of, the two of us idiots at least we end up in the same place all the time coming yeah because <laughs> we're handcuffed together no it's like uh the one time i think we didn't agree was on whether gh was controlled or not and the answer is it's not controlled yeah, yeah, but, exactly. it's illegal. You, you, but you go to prison for five years five and you sell years. it and it's yeah. like, wait a minute, wait, wait. So it's not controlled, but you imprison people for yeah. selling it because it's a five-year felony. So I guess what that means is to be the patient who has the GH, there's no possession, possession charge. But I, selling GH yeah, is yeah. a five-year yeah. felony. So or, or intent to distribute, right? Without right. medical needs. So if you any if not that this would ever happen, but if somebody was to try to arrest you under the grounds of possession of GH. Don't just roll over on your dealer because they don't have a charge. They're lying to you. Make sure to talk to your attorney before you answer any questions. Don't ever answer. I once had a buddy go to prison for 10 years because he signed a confessional because the, the cops told him, we're going to charge your parents because they knew about okay. the crime. And he signed it because he wanted to protect his parents. 
instead of just what do you call it sit, talking to a lawyer first and i was like for fuck's sake man why didn't you talk to a lawyer and he's like well because i was scared and i was like that's why you talk to a lawyer like whatever you do say w- w- one word lawyer and if you only have one number number memorized it should be your lawyer's phone number yeah and that's it i mean no matter what it sucks in, in this field your personal use possession charge if there is a drug that's controlled on your possession apparently gh is not one of them it's a, you have a personal use amount and that's going to be a misdemeanor that'll be apt up to a year probation or 30 days in jail whereas if you roll over on somebody like the guy who sold it to you he's going to go to jail for 10 20 years so that's just not worth it in the karmic scheme of things what you should do is just talk to a lawyer and plead it down to a first time possession charge and get um a, tw- a 12 months i think 20 years ago it was called the 7411 and that you basically it'll get expunged from your record if you complete probation they'll tell you they'll drug test you for anabolics they won't that they do is a, a seven panel drug screen and it'll test you for um stuff like heroin methamphetamines opiates marijuana it's they don't test for steroids and if you were using testosterone, like HRT test or growth hormone, even if you have growth hormone or testosterone in your blood, you're allowed to have that because it's naturally producing. Furthermore, they would have to test you just for Nandrolone, Anavar, and the other drugs. So whenever you're being drug tested, even if you're being drug tested for steroid use, you can get away with using testosterone because the athletic commissions will do an E to P ratio or E to T ratio. And then you're allowed up to a six to one ratio. So if you're using HRT doses and you're taking natural test boosters to go along with it, you should be able to pass that six to one ratio. And what I was going to say, I've never seen a natural person pass six, like any person's going to pass six to one on steroids, maybe not, but that natural person isn't ever going to be above like a four to one. Well, that's, I guess, my point is I'm saying that even if they're drug testing you and they're telling you they're drug testing you for steroids, you could still take a low dose of testosterone and still pass oh, it. Yeah. They're, and they're not going to, I don't think any law enforcement is going to do any metabolite tests to see what drug. It's a 20,000 hour test. Like, right. they, that, that's, yeah, they don't care. They, and, and like the same thing with um, natural bodybuilding organizations, but that you pay $100 to get drug tested, they just throw out your drug test. Same thing with the, like Michigan Department of Corrections. Michigan Department of Corrections is the one when you get drug tested, they send it to the Michigan Department of Corrections, if you're in Michigan, obviously, and they just throw it out and they pocket the money. The judges are the ones who own the drug testing facilities. That's why the judges here, if you have a domestic violence, if you have a DUI, if you have a possession, everyone gets drug tested for drugs and alcohol, no matter what, because the judge ordering the drug testing owns the drug testing facility. And they don't actually test the, dr- the, dr- the drugs. They usually just throw them out because it costs them money. They get to make money off of you because you have to pay for this as a condition of your probation. But they don't actually spend anything if they don't test the, the blood because they don't really care. No, they definitely don't care. Yeah. So I mean, I know that I basically just gave a crash course on how to be a criminal. And that wasn't the intention of this. But, hey, it's a... Uh, is what it is. I wonder if are we allowed to even talk about that on YouTube? What is that? Um, I, I mean, are you yeah, are you allowed to talk about drug testing and what they oh, test sure. for? It's and, you can look it up. They yeah, I guess you could look it up. It's not. I just saw it. some. I saw some dude giving himself a lat injection the other day on Instagram, and apparently that's okay now. So I can start doing a course oh. on how to give yourself injections. I just said. No offense, the last person I saw give himself a lat injection got sepsis and almost died. So I don't know if I'd be. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm. I don't know why I'm laughing about that. That's not good. I hope he's okay now. Yeah, we should all just stick to our glutes, perhaps the shoulder. Oh, I I do I do shoulders. I do triceps with GH. I do biceps. That I do lats. I don't do quads because that hurts and my glute Honestly, isn't lean enough good. right now. Yeah. Um. You want to talk about Nandrolone? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the point of this video. It's an Nandrolone yeah. video, yeah. not the criminal con- misconduct video. All right. So, Nandrolone. Do you, you want, want to give a... Or you want to just... Yeah, why don't you give a... 
let's just do a presentation because I know that the last two episodes we did confused the flying fuck out of people. Okay, I mean, I'll give a, a brief, like, real rough one. I mean, so it was it was first described medically in the 1950s. It was invented by a scientist named A.J. Birch, who was an MD and a scientist out of Oxford University. He was Australian himself, uh, but he was studying at Oxford. And he basically reduced the aromatic rings and invented 19 or the whole class of 19 or drugs. Mandolin was the first. Uh, it was the parent drug there. Um, they actually named the process birth reduction after him. And it was it's a very complex process. And it's still debated. It was debated until the 1990s if it was a valid way to make something. Um, so he was way ahead of his time. So um, it was basically nandrolone, prestolone, trembolone, um, mebolone, which is check drops. And it was one other one, I think. There were, there were like seven main ones, and then there were 20 other ones that like, were just shelved. Uh, nandrolone was used medically starting in, in the 60s. It started with MPP, phenylpropanate, and as durabolin. And then in 62, it came out as decadurabolin. And the FDA chose to use decadurbalm as the preferred medicine. I've never seen nandolone phenylpropanate used medically ever. I don't know if you have. So they chose, they, they, the main reason why they chose DEC is because of the longer half-life, right? So it was used in women and children and, you know, for osteoporosis and possible, you know, inoperable breast cancer. And they didn't want people to have to get injections frequently. So nandolone was, uh, decanoate was the chosen ester. The, Nitrogen retention is also twice as great with decanoate as it is with MPP. So we can do a whole episode on this too, but the ester definitely changes the effects of the base compound, not just in the duration that it's released. So there are other effects that occur. Um, go ahead. All right. So I, rather than glossing over this, because okay. this is something I've heard you say before, I've never heard before in my life. I've heard okay. anecdotally people say trenacetate works better than trenanathate, but no one has a reason. I think this is basically what you're saying now is that if DECA's ester causes more nitrogen retention than the, phenyl than the phenylpropanate, can you explain why? I, I think the short answer is the time that it's interacting with the cells. So I'm going to guess what I always thought was. There are other, there are other things too, because it's in testosterone, there's a difference in the kinetics of, of testosterone propionate versus an anthater siphonate. Um, we can get to that in a second. And timotremblone, there are other effects that occur between acetate and an anthate and parabol. All right. So let, let's stick with just this NPP versus Nandrol Deca comparison. And maybe we can extrapolate that okay. later on. So what I would think is because NPP is in and out in three days and DEC is in your system for two years, that it builds up in your system to such a level that it's the total level is higher, even if you're dosing them the same. If you're doing 100 milligrams of NPP a day versus 100 milligrams of nandrolone a, time, a yes. day, that, that after two months – the level in your blood is higher with the DECA than there is with the NPP, and thus it's going to work better. Yeah, but not to confuse, because people might get confused by that. It, initially, the MPP dose is higher, right, because the ester is lighter. Phenopropanate well, is lighter. I thought, I thought they're the same. I thought they both come out to being 37% of the molecule is phenopropanate and the decanoate. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm talking about. I'm, I'm just thinking of propionate. Yes, they're, they're close. The, the half life. The are phenol. Half. That even though the yeah the half life of phenylprop and prop is the same, but the molecular weight of the yes. phenylprop is yes. so high that it's just as bad as having the deca ester when it comes to. Yes. So in yes. other words, to yes. put it in layman's terms, when you inject 200 milligrams of nandrolone decanoate, you're getting 125 milligrams of nandrolone. When you inject 200 milligrams of MPP. NPP, you're still only getting 125 milligrams of nandrolone. However, right. conversely, if you were to use TREN, you're getting 87 milligrams of TREN per 100 milligrams of acetate. Yeah. yeah, for acetate. Whereas it's with the other, with the, it's I think like a 62. So you're I getting 72 for 
Maybe it's 72. So the point is you get more tren out of tren acetate than you do out of tren um, anathate. Obviously, one's at 100, one's at 200. But once you do the math and you equate them for 200, you're still getting way more out of tren acetate. That is not the case with NPP. And Correct. All right. I was, yeah. I was thinking about poking in my head. The... Um, with the trend specifically, though, there's other effects that occur because of the ester. So you get a different, you get a prostaglandin response from all trend, but the prostaglandin response is different from acetate, and it causes more stem cell proliferation. And that's why it's used in cattle, and then they attach a polymer to it to slow it down. They don't want the fast in and out with the acetate part, but they want the response of the acetate, but not the not the short half length. That makes sense. All right. So the acetate causes the prostaglandin. Which is why you get the trend cough with acetate, but not an athate. Well, yes, yes, it's part of it because you're getting like a microembolism, right? You hit the vein, and then the prostaglandin rises really fast, and it constricts your, you know, your bronchial. All right, and then prostaglandin, I believe, is either E or F it's is E2. directly anabolic. It's E2 is directly anabolic, E2, and that directly causes stem cell proliferation. So that's what it. So what causes stem cell migration? I G M G F. And yes. E alpha causes yes, migration, alpha and, and then E beta causes proliferation, and prostaglandin E2 causes proliferation. Yes. And so you have okay. kind of, that's why they have the estradiol too, right? So, and also for the IGF. Right, right. Because you need the estradiol, otherwise, you would have to have MGF, and cows don't lift. No. And so, and this is why. And people are going to, um, people are, Victor Black is probably watching this and losing his mind, but he's wrong because I've done projects with Merck with that product. And that's just why acetate is chosen because I've, I've had this exact discussion with, with them when they were making it. And the thing is they're not using, because they could, <clears throat> they could just use a longer ester. That doesn't solve the problem, right? Anyone who's used trend ananthate or trend acetate, there's a different effect, right? The, the cumulative effect down the road is pretty similar, but there's, there's, there's a different effect. Shit, people are going to get so fucking angry that they're confused oh, about this. I'm going to just say this one more time real simple. So there's a satellite cell and there's a muscle cell. And the muscle cell will get bigger, but it won't split into two cells. The satellite cell can migrate and attach itself to the muscle cell, yeah. then proliferate by dumping a, a nucleus yeah. from the satellite cell into the muscle cell. And now yeah. there's enough nuclei density so when it spreads it can split into two muscle cells so we get hyperplasia not just hypertrophy so people are injecting gh because they want the hyperplasia not hypertrophy the mechanism that causes this is mgf which yeah. is local igf1 which mm -hmm. is stimulated by heavy assets or injecting the muscle directly with gh the other thing that causes this is estrogen. Not yeah. only does estrogen yeah. convert the GH to the IGF-1 and the MGF, it also can bind through estrogen alpha and cause migration of the satellite cell and bind with beta receptor to cause proliferation of the cell. In addition to that, we've got the prostaglandin E2 which also causes proliferation, which basically what we want is to have a complete robust muscle training response. We want to lift with 80% of our one RM. We want to take our sets to at least within five reps of failure. So if you're using 80% of your one RM, that means you could get eight reps in theory, the eighth rep would be a failure rep. You want to do that at least three or four times, if not six times. More than that's are debatable whether it's worth the juice for the squeeze when it comes to the whole life cycle of the workout and for the next day's workout and the next day's workout. It adds up for cumulative fatigue if you go beyond 2RR. But all that aside, the point of the lifting is just to generate the MGF. Yes, we can. Right, the, which you can get through the IGF-1 growth through the injection. But if you have estradiol, you have prostaglandin E2, you have androgen receptor binding, which is basically any anabolic steroid, and you have the MGF or local IGF-1 as it's known. Those four things, prostaglandin E2, uh, estrogen, an androgen binding like testosterone, and the GH, which converts to um, IGF-1, 
I think I said them all right. MGF, prostaglandin E2, testosterone, estrogen. Yeah, I, 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 I'm somehow confusing myself. It's MG, MGF, prostaglandin E2, estradiol, testosterone, yeah. or derivative. That's right. And okay. the reason why you don't want to take like Advil after you lift, like a lot of guys, are, they're right. sore. And then, and well, right. So we have those four things. That's what's going to stimulate the muscle cells to grow in bigger and split because we're going to have the satellite cell migrate. We're going to have the satellite cell proliferate. We're going to have the cell hypertrophic. Then we're going to have the cell hyperplastic. And yep. that's the four steps, the four mediators. Lifting is one of those four things. You And then what he was saying was any NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and for some reason Tylenol, is going to stop this pathway of prostaglandin synthesis. It's through the cyclooxygenase inhibitors. They're called COX-2 inhibitors, or that's cyclooxygenase inhibitors prevent arachidonic acid from going down the prostaglandin pathway, and it shunts over to the leukotriene pathway, which means you're going to get um, uh, lung effects like coughing. Yeah. So what they're saying is, at Merck, the reason why we use acetate is because we yeah. want the prostaglandin effect because we want the satellite cell migration in cattle. That is, and none of this had to do with nandrolone, but it sure is fucking. No, interesting. so they're both like genors, right? No, and my, right. my point was that the ester. I we can do a whole thing on this. Now it doesn't mean that the ester, the ester is not changing the base chemical. I'm not ever saying that, right? It's still the base. It can change the effects, right? If you do this in anesthesiology. I don't know how much of that you've done, but when <laughs> that was 20 years ago, man, like I don't remember I mean, that shit. Just, you can change the effects based on how long you're. In testosterone, you see, and then we can move back to Android. So in testosterone, you see difference with testosterone propionate and uh, let's say anampate. So in propionate, if you administer 100 milligrams every other day, you will still fall on the high rate of normal for most people. Mm -hmm. You will pass that drug test that you were talking about. And you will also see concurrent natural markers. Uh, I don't want to get too much of the carbon stuff, but. The, the markers of natural produced testosterone and the synthetic injected testosterone, you'll see them in parallel in the blood with testosterone propionate showing that the HPTA is not really affected. Whereas if you injected in a, an equimolar amount of ananthate in to match that dose, you would not get that. The HPTA would shut down it would shoot your testosterone level too high. You'd fail a drug test, right? You'd get other things. So it's just showing that I can send you these studies. It just shows that the estrogen does affect the way the drug works. All right, so I'm going to restate that, and hopefully, not that you didn't say it clearly, but I think people need to hear it two different ways. If you inject every other day with a short-acting ester, it doesn't shut off your balls, and your balls still make testosterone, so you can still pass a drug test because you still have some of the E to P ratio. If you were to inject the exact same amount of testosterone every day, especially with a long well, ester, like a SIP or an anaphate, because it would build up in your system because of the long esters, there's it will shut off your balls and you will not produce a natural testosterone. And it will be clear through a drug test that you're using synthetics. It's possible that part of that's mediated through estrogen production, right? Again, that gets very controversial, but it's possible that the long ester test will aromatize more than the propanate. I know that people argue it won't. I it's a theory. I'm not saying that that's the case. I think it's but, the opposite because instead of having that spike where there's a yeah. threshold, and if you spike above that threshold, everything above that threshold amount gets cleaved off by aromatase. Whereas if you hover right under that threshold, then the, the aromatase enzyme doesn't get upregulated and your threshold will go up so that yeah. later you can add yeah, more not, and then later you can add more. I wasn't saying that's the theory that I'm using. I'm just saying oh, that was okay. one of the theories because estrogen will shut off the HPTA access, right? To just from yeah. Well, yeah. testosterone will to an extent, right? Because the hypothalamus senses an androgen level too, right? It's looking at androgens, estrogens, and other hormones. It's gonna, it wants to see what's really going on. But an androgen on its own, it takes a much higher amount than it does. Once you add estrogen in there, it shuts it off faster. Yeah. So, in other words, when it comes to the brake pedal and testosterone production, you've got three feet. You've got yeah. testosterone, estrogen, and DHT, and the estrogen's the heaviest foot. When it steps on the brakes, it really steps on the brakes. Whereas testosterone and DHT, when they step on the brakes, they gently step on the brakes. Okay. You're better at explaining this stuff than me. 
Well, I'm, I'm not better. I'm just trying to say it a different way because our, our last couple of videos, people were getting nosebleeds and aneurysms and shit. They're foaming at the mouth. It was killing people left and right. Okay. I'll stick to the yeah. <laughs> No, I think, I think it's great that we just talk about it. And then we'll, I'll just put a pause you can on it. I, need, I should have someone behind me that's doing some sort of. <laughs> the Helen Keller? What is yes, it? Sign language stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, man. I always thought that was weird different. because if she's blind and deaf, uh, <laughs> what good is sign language? Like, how does that help? <laughs> it's a, a books, books on Braille. You know, like, I was like, so, wait a minute. That's full circle. Yeah, so Nandrolone, um, yeah, so except it approved in 62, and it, it was used for a long time, and then there was a brief period where it was not approved, right? And then it's currently approved again. Um, what else do you want to talk about Nandrolone history-wise? Okay, so there's there's some, well, so there's my big things about Nandrolone that always bug me. It has a higher binding affinity to the androgen receptor than testosterone. Testosterone yeah. has a 1.0 because it's the baseline standard, right? It's an androgen receptor. Testosterone is a 1.0. DHT has either like a 5.0 or a 3.0, depending on where you uh, look. I think five, yeah. But yeah, and then you've got that doesn't mean it's more efficacious. No, it no, 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 no. It's more yeah, potent. Because it gets produced, right? It gets produced again. Right. Me and Victor had this issue where he basically mm -hmm. misunderstood what I was saying about the difference between potency and efficacy, and he's trying to make me look bad. And I'm just like, oh, man, I just like I even gave him examples of his little animal studies and it just wasn't enough. So going to the, the F, binding affinity of Nandrolone, my understanding is it's 1.54. The binding affinity of Trenbolone is like 1.34. So which means that both Nandrolone and Trenbolone bind to the androgen receptor stronger yeah, than testosterone. testosterone. Yeah. So, so therefore, it, they should be more efficacious at muscle synthesis they don't necessarily show that but the and to back up so people understand that so people love to use the word sarm right and they're referring to that junk gray market stuff so technically nandrolone and trembolone are both sarms in theory right they're steroidal sarms though versus the yk11 and all that garbage are non-steroidal sarms so you could trembolone is technically a sarm. It was designed to interact with the androgen receptor specifically, and the theory wasn't supposed to hit anything else. But of course, in practice, that doesn't work at all. Um, right now, so the definition of sarm is selective androgen receptor modulator, yes. and you could show it with nandrolone or trend. If you block the androgen receptor, neither of them work. Right versus if you block, if you use flutamide and you block the androgen receptor, and you administer testosterone, there are still effects that occur. Right, so testosterone has both, and this is where it's debatable if nandrolone is really more efficacious than if, just, if nandrolone is more efficacious than testosterone. Is that there are non-genomic effects of testosterone well, that nandrolone does? So, I mean, to me, the argument which is better, test or nandrolone, is kind of dumb because it's like, what's better, steak or potatoes? It's like, well, I eat steak with potatoes, yes. and I eat my potatoes with my steak. So it doesn't matter whether which one's better. It's what's better, having steak or having steak with yeah. potatoes. Yeah. And I like steak with potatoes because the potatoes absorb the blood, and it makes the potatoes taste better. And it makes it less messy on the plate. So therefore, it isn't so much is it better to use nandrolone than testosterone? Is that is it better to add nandrolone to HRT levels of testosterone, or is it better to take a massive blast of testosterone and for the purpose of muscle growth? And again, that's right. That's you and I were going back and forth on that. Right. And that's what I, this is my conclusion. You need to have some testosterone to get some estradiol because you need the estradiol for one of the four horsemen of muscle growth. Um, and also you need the estradiol to convert the GH over to the IGF one. So really you need estradiol for two of the horsemen of muscle growth. Yeah. And unless you lift heavy as fuck. And I was going to back up for a second because it was kind of like a, a mind blowing thing for me too. So the common, the, the common thing is people think nandrolone aromatizes at 20%. Right of testosterone, I if you actually think about the number. The number is right. Testosterone aromatizes at five percent. So nandrolone right. actually aromatizes at one percent. So right. twenty percent sounds really um, almost great, but it's not. It's one percent of an aromatizes. Right. So it produces almost no estradiol on its own. 
So what you get is a balance. You need to have the balance of DHT to estrogen because if the DHT is higher than the estrogen, you get hair loss. If the estrogen is higher than the DHT, you're yeah. going to get gyno growth. You need to keep them in balance. But uh, at some point, too much is still too much. So ideally, I found that for me, the happy number for estradiol is about 80. So I want to use enough testosterone so I can get an estradiol of 80 and then fill in the gap with something else. Now, as we established in the last episode, since Primo has an AI component and Mastron does not, if you run Primo, you're going to crush your E2 and then it's going to have a DHT imbalance, whereas in Masteron, it doesn't have the estradiol. I mean, it doesn't have the aromatase yeah. component, it, it aromatase inhibitor component. It does have an estrogen beta antagonist event, or, sorry, yeah. so that it should block CERM, so it should block the um, breasts from oh, growing. Yeah. Yeah. And it might actually inhibit some of the effects of the estrogen acting on the muscle tissue growth. We don't know, is it a selective estrogen receptor modulator or is it generalized every estrogen receptor block beta receptor is going to get blocked so we don't know because for instance tamoxifen is a serm a selective estrogen receptor modulator it does opposite things in the breast as it does in the liver so it, it, it's your friend in the liver and it's your friend on the breast so the and then again tamoxifen actually converts into two different metabolites one is a stronger serm and one is an AI, a very strong AI. So none of this is cut and dry. All of it's confusing. And like, as Kurt pointed out, he found that new study from 2023 on Primo just recently, like last week. It was exactly September 2nd that he called me about it. Yep, it was September 2nd that he found that article. So where I guess I'm going with this is, Instead of using Masteron, would you get more out of using Nandrolone as your second line agent? And based off the efficacy thing, we don't know. It is a stronger androgen receptor binder, and it won't inhibit the estrogen beta receptor. However, my personal experience is since it amplifies the aromatase enzymes effect yeah. exponentially, you're going to get rampant gyno growth if you mix Nandrolone right? with 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 test now would that occur if you were running just hrt levels of test and a lot of nandrolone i don't know i know that if i had 140 DH2 nandrolone hmm? I, i'd say it's possible your dh it's probably an individual thing your dht might be too low depending on the person at that point right for example i have ran i was running 1400 milligrams of nandrolone i added 200 milligrams of test and I got impotence immediately. Yep. And so I never used test for years afterward. Then I started using test and then using test and primo. And then I had balanced out the test and primo at exactly a one to one ratio of 700 to 700, which gave me a 40 estradiol, which was good. It's good conversion of GH to IGF 1. It's not optimal, but it's still good. Yeah. It's, about it's about 90%. It's about 90% of what you can get out of 80 that 40 is about 90% as effective as 80. And then I added in 20 milligrams of nandrolone a day, NPP. I was fine. I went up to 30 milligrams of nandrolone a day, which is the normal amount, which is 200 a week to get the maximum um, collagen synthesis. And I started getting gyno. So all it took was going from 1400 to 1600 total load going from 700, 700, zero to 700, 700, 200. And then boom, I had rampant gyno and now I have to get surgery. It's a year later, or it's almost two years later, but I'm going to end up having to get surgery because no matter how much tamoxifen I used, I could shrink it, but I couldn't eradicate the right gyno. The irony is the left gyno that's been there for several years is never gets bigger or smaller. It stays the size of like a piece of rice. Uh, but the one on the right came out of nowhere, grew from a pea size to a grape size, and I can shrink it back to a pea size, but it's still kind of visible if I diet down all the way to being stage lean. So in order to get on stage again, I have to get it cut out. And that's why I'm apprehensive to use Nandrolone is because if it's not really worth it in the end, um, the other big flaw with the Nandrolone is the brain damage from the cortisol receptor blockade. Yeah, and it, it changes actually a bunch of cell cycle stuff 
not only in the brain, but in the liver, in the testicles. It, they're, we're learning more and more about nandrolone. It might not be the safest drug. What can you explain some about the cell cycle liver changes? There, there's a ton. I, I don't off the top of my head. I don't know all of them. So I can send. Are we them. talking about like the CD4 and CD12 yeah. pathways? Okay. So it basically, when you say the cycle cycle changes, it's improving the probability of getting cancer. Yep. Okay. So that there's a possibility that the defense mechanisms our bodies has in place, like I think it's called um, capsaicin or something like that. Is like the grim, not capsaicin. That's like the pepper, but yeah, um, capsaicin. Um, caspases, uh, yeah. is something with a C. It's like the grim reaper of the cell, and if it starts to see proliferation at the CD4 checkpoint of mitosis, then it will cause apoptosis of the cell, yep. and that's what you're talking about. Because I think there's CD1, two, and then at CD4 is also ATF4. Is a, the, the, two different scientists discovered CD4 and ATF4. And so they have two different names. And ATF4 is in neurons what determines our memory plasticity. And so I think if, to give rats versus humans too sometimes. So it gets yeah. When for instance, when I was in grad school doing my uh, master's in neuropsychopharmacology, I was trying to develop a drug that would I gave it to somebody and they would have my memory. And that basically the flaw in it was this is Dr. Eric Handel's works basically, and that if the flaw in that is because it disables the ATF4 enzyme, which prevents you from memorizing everything on first exposure, you need to have three exposures for long-term potentiation of neurons, plasticity, that what happens is that because you stop that enzyme, what no one realizes is that was same enzyme as the CD4 enzyme, and that you basically were setting someone up to get neuronal cancer basically glioblastomas and that luckily no one made the drug because somebody was smart enough to say, yeah, that's the same enzyme as the anti-cancer enzyme that stops the cell from um, infinitely proliferating. Not to to fully fall off the wagon here, but do you know about the new glioblastoma treatment? No, what? So letrozole. What? I'll send you that too. So it's in its stage three now of FDA approval. (laughs) So it was discovered oh. by this lady at Ox- again at Oxford. A woman had breast cancer that metastasized and when it went to her brain and she developed glioblastoma, they put her on letrozole for the breast cancer and they were doing scans in her brain to check the progression. And sure enough, after a couple of weeks of letrozole, the glioblastoma was gone. But I mean, if the glioblastoma wasn't an actual original neuronal cancer line, it was breast tissue growing inside the brain, well, that's different. Well, what's weird is the cell line, the gene that it's growing on, that the letrozole is stopping is actually a cardiac gene, a potassium channel. I can send you this stuff. It's different, And this is why, so I talked to people at other pharmaceutical companies, I'm not going to name names. One of the reasons why it was missed initially is because they look at oncogenes, they don't look at cardiac genes for cancer. So it was that whole segment was left out of cancer research. Not intentionally. It was they, they want them to focus on what they're doing and not be looking all over the place. Okay. So this, despite the fact that it was found coincidentally, because it was a mast, a ma- whatever, a breast cancer cell that's bred to the brain, and that there was it wasn't two different cancers occurring in the same patient at the same time randomly, it was still the breast cancer activated the yes. neurons to be its own independent primary cancer yet the letrozole cured both the ne- the brain the neuron cancer and the breast cell cancer in yeah, the and it's, it's done through it's called the ether agogo potassium uh current is the gene well that's but exciting i'll send it to you right now the lestrozole can cure brain ca- glioblastoma. I, I'm not going to use the word cure, right? I think. Well, that's... between, I, I mean, like, yeah, okay. It's it's a op, it's a treatment modality that has it's yet to have been explored and can be used in combination with gamma knives and with everything. Yeah, I heard it. The gamma knives and other stuff like platinum to help shrink down the tumor so that brain surgery can remove the tumor. So if one, it's cool because it's just it, the drug's been around for a long time, right? And it's open, it's another one that's not controlled. 
Oh, that's true. It is in control. In fact, I have a jug of it. I have like a one gallon jug of it here. I got it for a hundred bucks. It's a gallon jug of letrozole. Yeah. And it's like each milliliter is worth 50 bucks. I've got a gallon of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like it's easily had. So, yeah. So long and the short of it is people are like, God damn, the, they don't see a topic at all. It's like, yeah, but no, know, no, you, you labeled this as Nandrolone and this is a bunch of shit I don't care about. And it's like, listen, guys, listen, if everybody just watched the whole advanced lecture series, then they'd learn a lot of cool shit aside from what the title is. I will tag the shit out of this, but I'm going to keep the title as Nandrolone because I'm not, I can't name it Nandrolone and DECA and NPP. That's what the tags are for. So it shows up on searches for everything, not just for what I named it. So but yeah, we, we covered a lot of cool stuff. Hmm? I feel bad. We, should, we can go back to Nandrolone. So <laughs> don't feel bad. So I'm Nandrolone, we got, we got the flaw of the brain, the cortisol inhibition, is damaging the brain that it can cause rampant aroma, uncontrollable forest fire in your breasts with aromatase. It can possibly cause liver and ball cancer. There is the rumor that it causes fibrosis, non-functional fibrosis of the heart, which I've never seen corroborated in humans. It's only in rats. And the way that they test these rats is they tie a weight around the rat's tail and they throw it in some water and they're like, can you, and they tell them to swim and then they never, and they basically let the rat swim until it drowns. And then they buy out, they uh, cut it up and look at the heart and see how much damage was done to the heart. And it's like, we don't train like that. We don't like, like synth synthesize drowning as our form of training. So it's not comparative at all. Yeah. We're doing anaerobic training, not aerobic training to the brink of death and beyond. So I, I can't really see a lot of impetus to use Nandrolone because Nandrolone's claim to fame is the cortisol inhibition. But if you're using Nand DECA or NPP as a bulking agent, you're in a calorie surplus, not a deficit. So it's cortisol inhibition is relevant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if we're not really getting any more synthesis, and if we were getting more synthesis, we're getting maybe 10% more. So that 900 DECA is equivalent to 1,000 test. Yes. Or a 900 DECA is equivalent to 1,100 Masteron. Yeah. And it's so, like, I'd rather just use 200 more of the Masteron that's yeah. safer than the DECA. I, yeah, I mean, the only way I could see it being used, and it's a little contradictory, what you said is perhaps if someone were to bring their test up to what they could tolerate, right, with no AI, and then they would stack an anabolic cream ball on top, which could act as an AI on top and drive some anabolism, and then perhaps stack a tiny bit of androlone on top of that to further drive protein expression. But I think the days of, like, huge amounts of DECA for no reason, or when, now everyone uses MPP. This is, like, the trendiest thing in the world now. Everyone right. all over the world is MPP. No one uses DECA. I'm probably the only one who prefers the original. Or the I always preferred DECA because MPP was too up and down. I don't like short-acting yeah, drugs. I like what I feel on it. But um, well, that's the only way that I would see it as a valid. I don't think it should be leveraged really hard anymore. I get that the guys in the 70s did, but I think they didn't have any other options. They didn't know. Yeah, the only, you know, the smart model, the J3U model, is to use 200 or less. That's, that's that what I'm you, saying. Usually you see their models being like two to 400 tests. All the rest is pretty much master on. And then like a little bit of Nandrolone is thrown in for collagen. Right. Yeah. Master on, whatever. But yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I don't think. And I think at 200 milligrams, you're still getting the satellite cell effects from Nandrolone, but without overloading anything else. And then to me, because the, the EQ is better at collagen, the nandrolone and if and i had to pick yeah. yeah and i mean i don't like the erythrocytosis effects of the eq and i don't like the um you know that's the big issue is the and the renal damage but like you said if you take enough vitamin c you can protect against the renal damage yeah. from the eq at least some of it right i mean the dose so is super high was was there other elements of Nandrolone that you thought were relevant? I mean, 
so people are going to say, well, it builds more muscle than test, right? Again, we're not talking about on its own because clearly on its own, I don't think it's going to do a whole lot. I think, I think a lot of it is the appearance of, right? There's some water retention, mineral retention that you get from Nandrolone that it makes you appear bigger and fuller. I'm not sure if, if there's actually any more tissue growth that's occurring. Right. Well, so, um, people confuse lean body mass with muscle. Yeah. So adding 10 pounds of water is not the lean. same thing as adding 10 pounds of muscle. Yes. But, but it is both, but it is an equal amount of lean body mass. And again, I think the studies are all confounded, right? Because they're, if people try to look this stuff up, all the data they're going to get are from chronic kidney disease, HIV wasting, and cancer. Those bodies respond different than a bodybuilder. So it's, you know, it's, it's preventing nitrogen loss more so in them than, you know, in you or I. I see. And okay, so if it, well, DECA retains more nitrogen than NPP. Yes. And how does testosterone testosterone what more than than any of the esters that i've seen okay so they've compared like to like long ester to long ester and nandrolone it, but the reason why nandrolone is better at nitrogen retention is because it's anti-cortisol it blocks the glucocorticoid receptor and stimulates the androgen receptor whereas testosterone doesn't block the glucocorticoid receptor, yeah, but DHT does. Yeah. The DHT does block the glucocorticoid receptor. So if you are running enough testosterone, you're going to get glucocorticoid blockade, I think, with DHT. Yeah, but you could also get that same effect, the, the, the glucocorticoid, with using Anavar, right? I was just going to say Anavar specifically, yeah. yeah. That, um, like or or Masteron. Well, no, I mean, there's a million, right? So I, right. not that I would always use all of them, but D-Ball, Anavar. Trembolone, halotestin will all block that to a significant amount versus right. just doesn't really do that at all. So one thing that what did you list off? You listed off cancer patients, HIV patients, and what? Renal, renal failure. Yeah, none of those people are eating calorie surplus. No, but they're, they're basically eating. right. They're, they're barely eating at all. So that's why a cortisol blocking agent will have more nitrogen retention than something that's purely stimulatory. But for you trying to grow, you're in a calorie surplus, so you don't need to worry about nitrogen retention. That's a given. If your BUN is high, yeah, anyway. you have nitrogen retention. Yeah. And you're eating and I, carbs and protein. Right. You're getting, you know, yeah, you're, so if you need 2,000 calories and you eat 2,500, you don't have to worry about nitrogen retention. Yeah. Nitrogen retention is something that's a factor for people who are dieting. And if yeah. you're dieting, Rather than using nandrolone, you're better off with trenbolone. It's the nandrolone yeah. that actually speeds up the metabolism because it's going to decrease TBG and drive up T3. It's going to also, I think it, this is confusing. I think it slows the conversion of GH to IGF-1, but it improves the response of the receptor uh, to yes. IGF-1. Uh, locally. Okay. Locally. Yes. locally, which is even better. So it yep. makes you grow more muscle from your GH indirectly. And it also works as an uncoupler at the mitochondria. So you burn fat faster. Yeah, correct. So, I mean, Tren is just a better cutting drug than Nandrolone. And Nandrolone is a great anabolic compared to nothing. But doing the test with mass with GH, GH combo meal is the smartest move yeah i would agree with that right and that's also not to go back to that but the rip we and we talked about this in one of the gh videos that's also one of the reasons why the gh is given in that huge bolus for the hiv patients is to stop the cortisol so they're just right which halfway as much as they can which is something that i didn't consider was just the calories until this conversation i was like wait a minute sickly people are sickly because they're under eating yeah. not because well, of the Cachexia is a common theme, but it's indirect, not direct, due to lack of appetite. Yep. Yeah, and that's, I, again, this is neither here nor there, but I think it's interesting, too, because the concept, the, most people think when they are on deck that they need to eat a boatload of food. But if you look at it, it's used medically, it's used the opposite way. Mm. Because it's used for nitrogen retention. Like you said, you'd already have the nitrogen retention if you're eating a boatload of food. Right. Right. Yeah. I think it. 
creates kind of a not a fantastic look when you eat a ton of food and you take deca no you look like a bloated pig yeah it's it's rough and it, your lower back's gonna be pumped all the time you feel like shit you look like shit oh <sighs> well that pretty much covers everything i want to talk to you about nandrolone <sighs> Sure, you don't mean to yawn. I've just been really tired today. I have <laughs> slept good last night, too. I feel like I need to take an extra rest day. I'm, like, I'm not in the mood to go to the gym, but... I'm I'm training too much. Much. Huh? I think I'm training too much, too. Oh, man, because I did a really good leg workout, not yesterday, but the day before, and I'm already recovered, which has never happened. Like, I'm recovering super fast, and I'm sleeping eight, nine hours a day every night right now, and I've shot up, like, weight and i look lean but my systemic fatigue is just way higher than it should be and wow. i it's it's light it's it's my push two today it's just like something inside of me is telling me do not lift and every time i don't listen and i go and i lift even though i go and shoot, I have a shit workout and or i get hurt and or i get sick um with you but you also change the gh amount for your reason right I have, I'm thinking about 13 yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So everything, like I was 12 all week last week. I think I went up to 13 this cool. week. I'm going to show that face a role in you being recovered and sleeping. I, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm due for a middle of the day shot too. I was doing <laughs> three in the morning, three, six hours later, and then the rest before bed split up in multiple spots. Yeah. As we talk about, they can watch that other video. They want to understand that. Oh, they won't. Because I get nothing but questions about that. Usually oh. it's like, wait a minute. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, the questions on that video. That is probably the most painful right. video I think anyone's That's, ever watched. I I was kind of hoping that my book would clear some of that stuff up, but apparently it didn't. I don't think people – I read it. You know, I was like, but I don't know how many people are going to read. Even though I tell them, it was like I sat down, I read the whole thing in one sitting, and I don't like sitting still for more than 20 minutes unless I'm watching TV. And I I ripped through it, but boy, I don't know if everybody else will be able to rip through that book. You know, I, not that you didn't write well, it clear. Two days. The average person was doing it in two days. Okay, cool. Because I think that um we just don't have readers anymore. No, and it, it's a lot to absorb. So you already knew a lot of the stuff in the book, so it was easier for you to get through. Yeah, pretty much all of it was reviewed for me, except for a couple key points were new revelations. Yeah right yeah and that's that's to be expected i wouldn't expect you to not know the majority of it right whereas if i had to read that and that was the first time i was learning about it wow. without pictures explaining what an intron and an axon is then it would basically throw me through a loop yeah but i think it, in general to be easy enough to read the average person so we go to get through it and take something from it it's not well i just think that a lot of people don't read things more than once I think that either through ego or a lack of scholastic um, experience, it never occurs to people to read it more than once. I mean, like read it, through it once and then start over and read it again. And every time you read it, you'll pick up something new or clarify I mean, things confusing. Well, you and I both had to do that with school. I mean, how many times I read stuff over and over and over again. So I always teach people my and study I tactic. I don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would call it, I had this study tactic in school that I didn't learn until I got in med school, but it was you take the book and you take a yellow highlighter and you read the book. And when you get to stuff you don't know, do it in the yellow highlighter. I did that then too. when you read the book the second time, just read the yellow part. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's, and here's the best part. If you still don't know it, go over the stuff you still don't know with a pink yeah. highlighter okay. and it turns orange so there will be sometimes stuff you will be pink because you thought you knew it the first time but now you don't know it the second time the stuff you knew it the first time you didn't know it the first time but you learned it the second time so it's still yellow and the stuff that you've read it twice through and you still don't fucking know it is an orange then you go over and you read the orange shit again and the stuff that's orange that you still don't know you underline it with a pen and then the night before the exam, you read all the yeah. underlined stuff. Yeah. That's it. That's all you have to do. Yeah. It's a control cramming. I do the same thing. Right. You can't know all this. It's, 
Right. And you just n- narrow it down. It's like big box, little box, little box, tiny box, boom. One shot, one kill. The test yep. is done. You got the highest grade in the class. And it's just do it like that. And that's the way you should definitely approach this stuff. Unfortunately, the people who write those papers, those um, PubMed articles and shit, they can't write for shit. So it's painful to try to read them. You well, happen to write really well. So yeah. going through your book is very easy. And I think with the PDF, there's the option of highlighting it, that you can highlight the PDF. And yeah, and so you can pick out you can selections. You can honestly print it out if I went if you really want to. Right. And, or, and so that's what I would have people do is just like, you know, highlight his book or print it and highlight it and review the material that's highlighted. And it, you don't have to read the white text. I'm no, but, but I, I mean, I had to read all those studies in order to write that book. So I had to, I had to go through all of the garbage that you just said that these guys can't write. Well, they can't write for shit. No. It's just this giant brick of a paragraph. No. And, that's, and it's like, and there's like two sentences that matter in the whole brick and they're in the middle somewhere. Yeah. And that's why like the, the data, I don't want to go too into it, but the data that you found groundbreaking, that was in a study that a million people have read, right? But no one pulled that data up because the study is so bad and so boring that no one ever bothered to look at those. Was numbers. it the Frost one from 2005? I think so. I think so. so it was in that one because I didn't have access to the full one. All right. I can I, I can send you a copy if you want. It's... Um, but that, that, that it's written like that stuff is so boring. Yeah, man, that's fucking brutal. That it's just brutal that the whole world overlooked the upper limit on GH per local ej- injection, and that if you do the math just right, it works out to being exactly what the maximum per day it can be within. It was twenty eight as opposed to thirty. Yeah, I mean, that's really pretty fucking close. That's like a ninety three percent accuracy on two studies coming to the same conclusion, but neither study knew what the other study was doing. So it no, has to be true. And then apparently after the studies were written, no one ever read them. That's right, of course. Right. <laughs> uh, well, I know John read them. I read the yeah, one of them, it. and I know John read both of them, but the connection wasn't made. Well, yeah, because the same thing, he probably just read over it quickly and pulled out what he wanted and moved on, right? I mean, I read those things over and over and over again. I was writing for eight hours a day. Wow. That's fucking nuts. Yeah, you need to get compensated for that book. All right, motherfuckers, buy this book because it's worth it. And and he spent an entire year writing it. That's where, yeah. So the next request we got was for Boldenone. Okay, we can do that. And we should go over that. And I also want to go over um, Paul Carter's philosophies and hear... I want to debate some of the differences between, which isn't fair to you because then I'm casting you as the villain per se, but I want to go over the, the, I want to go over the differences between Paul Carter and Israel's beliefs and see where there's overlap and where there's divergency and see if there's some type of science we can deduce why one feels the way that, and the other one doesn't and whatnot, because I think that everything Paul says, I like, it's just that I think that a lot of it's overly simplified. It is. I think it his is. audience I, is a TikTok yeah, audience. I think, and that's what I said to you, I think that he's oversimplifying on purpose because if you follow him on Instagram, he gets a lot of redundant, dumb questions all day long. And you can't, the problem is you can only dumb it down so much, right, without really making it simple. So he's just, this is how it works, instead of being like, it works here. Because then people get more confused. They just want an answer. I, I noticed that, yeah. As, you know, when people say, so how much GH should I be taking a day? And I was like, how much are you taking? Yes. And then they'll tell me how much they are taking. It's like, do you have side effects above this level? And they're like, no. And it's like, how much can you afford? And they're yes. like, I can't, only this much. I'm like, based on then, what you can afford, you do this. You know, and like, I make it specific for them because if it's, if I give them the science of it, I, I could just be a jerk and say, rewatch the video because you didn't understand it. But that no, doesn't mean they're going to understand it the second time. No, they wouldn't. Because they, they would have already gotten it probably. No, and it's, and it's a lot of the same redundant questions like, when do I eat? When do I take it? When do I like, Right. Oh, God. I, I got so many questions about eating and GH. I don't know where this myth that eating and GH are relevant to each other got started, except for the best I can assume is that because when you and, eat... Uh, 
there's endog there's insulin there's release. very confused about that that's different and then insulin causes natural gh to not that's get released different. that has no relevance on injecting growth hormone no. and, and injecting insulin they're two entirely different things and then furthermore if anything the insulin present from eating would amplify the conversion of gh to igf1 sure. so you would yeah. want to but what i also mentioned that i would have my protein and gh and then two hours later, I'd want to have my carbs and insulin. And that is to reset the, in the GH receptor. That isn't necessarily to drive up IGF-1 conversion, although that would probably work too. Yes. Um, but two, I mean, two really simple things. If you look at the instruction, you can find it online or you, if you have serostin. The serostin, which is the FDA approval in the U.S. for HIV, not nowhere in that manual does it say take fasted, take on an empty stomach, wait six hours, do some cardio. It's given at night before bed as one shot in one bolus, and it doesn't matter if they've eaten or not. They get it, it doesn't affect it, right? And the other thing is, um, what was I don't even I lost the other one. There was another one I was gonna make, and then they don't have you refrigerate it before you sell well, it. Wait, well, and what could the the water that comes in the six milliliter, the six milligram bottles, you it's not bacteria static anyway. <laughs> That's funny. So, so like everything people think they know about GH is false, except for when we go yeah. over in the videos. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's weird, man. It's it's weird that all these years later it's still the same bro science nonsense. Because it's it and then just no one read the package insert. It's like all yes, someone had to do was get real GH and read the package well, insert to learn about GH. It doesn't say anywhere to take on an empty stomach. It doesn't matter. But people will also say, yeah, but it also says to inject in the fat on your stomach. And it's like that's just because how are you going to inject the fat on your back with with a tentacle? Like you have to inject in the front of your body, and the fattest part of your body is usually your stomach. So well, that's why they have you injected on your stomach. And, and I'm assuming you've seen people with AIDS before, right? Most people haven't. They don't have a lot of muscle on them, right? So where are you doing an IM injection? And they tend to actually have very strange fat storage on their stomach. So the, that cortisol is high. Yeah, right. Like it's not the look that it, they don't look like no. a bodybuilder. And no, they the have a, a lot of fat on their stomach because cortisol redistributes fat to the stomach. Yeah, and you see, even on the if you look at the the dosing chart, the max the max weight for the biggest dose is over 140 pounds. That tells you how thin these people are. Right. So in and theory, the, weight units is for 140 pounds. pounds. So like and for the, someone like Chase, older. who's right. So like Chase, who's 280, could theoretically take 36 units, hmm. not 18. It, it, yes, in theory. All right, buddy. I'm gonna let you go, and we can do this again soon, man. Yeah, we should do Bolden on next. Yep, Bolden on. Cool. All right. So remember, click the link in the description is to get Kurt's book and coaching, and your coaching. And oh yeah, and coaching, and my coaching, or whichever we whatever flavor suits you. Yeah, um, we're on the same. All the the links are in the description box. Um, have a good day, guys. I hope you learned something. If you're confused. Feel free to ask questions in the description in, in the, um, the comment section and, you know, we will answer them. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Cool.